and that was my first real, um, I guess, it was probably one of my first real jobs. Um, and the fact that it turned into 30 episodes was, or no, 20, sorry, I exaggerated. <laughs> It was 50 episodes, it was amazing. 100 <laughs> episodes later. It was, I know, I'm, I, I can't, you know, I'm still on the show, you just you don't see me anymore because I'm playing an invisible um, supernatural ghost. But I'm pretty sure I died on that show too. Um, no, actually, Hildy's not dead. I mean, who knows? Well, Hildy's somewhere, probably still pining over Harry. Um, <laughs> It was amazing. I mean, I was I had my first job was working on a show that had the most incredible writers, um, and even such a small role as being Pete's secretary turned into um, a, a real character. And I think that was when I first got the job. I was like, okay, I have to be like a 100% full person because it's so easy on on a, on a job that you have one or two lines in or three lines in an episode. It's like really hard to have a full character. It's almost easier, you know, it's harder when you don't have enough, a lot to work with. You have to make up, you have to fill in all the missing holes about who this person is. It kind of like, by the end of season one, I feel, or by the middle of season one, I feel like we had created, just by chance, um, Vincent Carbizer and I had created this animosity towards each other, and I noticed all my wardrobe pieces were like covering everything, like the, the pieces would go up to my neck, and I was like, so I'm approved. Okay, but I get drunk at least once a year and hit on Harry, who I'm apparently still in love with. Like, she still has dinner with her parents once a week. She, you know, so there, I figured out little things along the way. But that was really fun. Um, the writers kind of picked up on things and went, okay, let's go in that direction. And got little, little snippets every season to play with, so it was great. You sort of say that you do a lot of work to um, build character. Like, um is there anything that you know about Hildy that nobody else knows? Well, probably like what I told you. I, I think, I don't think other people would have picked up on, oh, she wears all of her wardrobe is covering a lot of skin, which means that she's approved, but she's also sexually repressed. So that's why when she gets drunk, she goes to bed in, in Harry's office. I mean, she wouldn't do that if she wasn't drunk because she's sexually repressed and she covers her skin and is, and she's, I don't know, she's more kind of a goody goody. Um, you know, I don't know if everyone would have picked up on that, especially because it's a smaller role on the show, but um, I felt like I, I needed that in order to feel like I was doing a good job, uh, in order for the writers to notice and for them to, to I mean, my, in the pilot, I had one line. Like, there was no. Um, definite, like, you'll be, you know, you'll have an arc in the story of uh, season one, and it just happened that uh, that's what happened. So, it's very lucky. Any other questions? Hands up. Anything about that? Super Mad? Well, actually, I don't have a question. have a proper question. Have you got any funny stories about any pranks from the Super Mad? You know, I have this question every time, and I did not get pranked. I did not get pranked, I know. I, I'm really regretting the fact that I did not get pranked because I never have anything to say when people ask me this. I, I didn't, they were awesome. I mean, uh, it was had to be one of my favorite sets I've ever worked on. Everyone was so kind and I think, you know, Jared and Jensen were so, are so good at it. You know, when you're the principal on a show, you kind of have to lead the way in terms of um, how the family is like how we treat each other, and they do such a good job of, of being a strong leader of that family, and they're so kind, the minute you show up on set, they're, you're part of the family, the minute you get cast, you're part of the family, and Eric Griffin is also really great about that, um, you know, he's brought me in on Revolution this past year as well, and so it, he's, they're, they're just like, and every, everyone I've met on the show, I, I love, like everyone is great, and that's rare to, to be on a set and to meet, meet people at conventions that I didn't work with, that I'm like good friends with, that came to my wedding, that I see every week now, and it's it's awesome. So, no pranks. No. You've obviously done quite a bit of genre on TV, like whether it be science fiction or supernatural type.
kind of stuff. It, is there something that draws you to that? Um, no, I think it's kind of by chance, I think, that I started booking that, but it, it Looking back, I feel like it does kind of make sense because whenever I see a breakdown, which is like a breakdown of character for an audition that says anything about the word ethereal, it's often for a sci-fi thing, and I'm always called in for it. And I think there's something, I don't know what it is about me that makes me seem ethereal, that makes me fit into that word. Uh, maybe the long red hair, maybe my features are like elfish, <laughs> but whatever it was, that word fits into sci-fi beautifully. And so I think maybe that, I don't know, I really don't know why, but I love it. I mean, I grew up um, kind of annoyed that my dad was always watching Star Trek. But now I'm like, yeah, you do watch all the cool shows. <laughs> and I watch a lot of sci-fi. I love sci-fi. I definitely enjoy the so, uh, Revolution, obviously, a pretty big show in terms of scope and scale and everything. Yeah. What, is, it, is it an enjoyable thing being able to work on sets that are so you know, complex and, and sort of all-encompassing? Or a yeah, show? I haven't worked on Revolution. Um, oh, sorry, did you say that? Oh, well, I went in, like I auditioned, so the Eric Kripke also made Revolution, so I meant by bringing that up, I just meant like he's... When, when I died in Supernatural, he's like, this is not the end of us, like, we'll, we'll work together again, that feeling of not, you know, even though he's killed you twice already, he wants to bring you back on his new show to kill you, and that would be awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I haven't really worked on, I mean, I would say Mad Men is probably, you know, all the details and the period piece, you know, everything has to be so perfect, maybe that would have been more qualified as, like, a big scope, but everything, I don't know, everything else. I'm not sure. I guess I guess so. I mean, Stargate had a big cast, but I felt like I just was shooting. We shot so much in the studio. I didn't ever leave, do anything outside of the studio because it was all on the ship. So, did, but, you, did you ever get to go on and do any planets? Did I get to go where? On do any planets in Stargate? No. Oh no. I, mean, I got killed. Uh, I was. <sighs> wow. I I was strangled to death <laughs> on like the sixth episode, I think. And then I came back and I was a hologram for an episode, and then I was a consciousness on a ship, still sailing somewhere in the universe, or in another universe, I guess. What's your favorite death so far? <laughs> My favorite death? Well, I mean, Supernatural was really awesome, but I didn't actually, you know, it was all CGI. So I didn't really get to like, I was just like, huh, cut, okay. You know, and then all, you know, they go in and they make me turn to fire and ash and just crumble and that, it, was, it looked awesome. Um, I was strangled to death twice. Wait, <laughs> twice? No, three times. Yeah, that, oh, wait, yeah, that was what, I don't know, I, I can't, I can't keep track. So, in 20 years time, apparently Sean Bean holds the record for most screen deaths. In 20 years time, is that going to be you? God, if everything goes as planned, I really hope so. <laughs> I hope they just keep creating more sci-fi shows, though, because if I only last, like, five episodes on your show, then... Hi. Hey, how's it going? I'm Ben, I'm Carl. Uh, going back to Star Trek Universe, obviously, I loved it. I'm sure lots of other people loved it. Uh, not enough people, obviously. Um, what is the last minute replacement, people? This is why it's so sparse out there. <laughs> But you're the important ones. Yeah. You came. That's it, exactly. Um, but uh, how was the feeling with, uh, I don't know if you still kept in contact with the crew after dying, obviously. Um, but how was the feeling about having it cancelled so soon and not getting a chance to flesh it all out? Well, it's disappointing because I feel like, I mean, it seems like they ended it in a way where they were cautious of that it would be cancelled. So I think that at least kind of gives the audience some sort of some sort of closure, but at the same time, I know, I'm like, well, I was a conscious, well, actually, by that time I was quarantined, so I had no access to anyone, and even, like, um, you know, Eli was, like, the only person on the ship, right, at that point, and we could have hung out, but, I mean, you know, there's nothing, everyone moves on to new shows fairly quickly, and, and so people are always like, oh, we're going to get back, you know, we're 
started the petition, and I'm like, oh, I don't think that's going to work because <laughs> everyone, you know, everyone goes on and does other works. And um, with Robert Carlyle, I mean, he did Once Upon a Time right away, and now that's going really well, and I can't really do Start the Universe without him. But um, I keep in touch with David Blue, he's great. Um, uh, a lot of the people still are, are Vancouver natives, so um, whenever I go up there, I'll let them know that I'm coming and we'll try to get together. But I mean, everyone's so wonderful. I, I mean, Vancouver is probably one of my favorite places to work. The people are so nice, and um, and I also have so many great memories of the shows that I've done up there. So I did actually Fringe up there too, so three shows up there that are just wonderful experiences. Vancouver seems to be a really big place for sci-fi. Yeah. What is, is there something in the water? It's always raining. It's oh. always raining there. And I think when you do sci-fi, there's got to be some sort of mystery in, in, the, in the environment. There's something... You know, it's the difference between when they did X-Files in, in Vancouver and then when they moved to LA, you can't shoot anything outside. It's not the X-Files anymore. It needs to be gloomy and, you know, have this kind of grittiness that LA is like, But um, most of my watch, like, I do enjoy Once Upon a Time. Um, had like a little argument with myself in season one on like, whether I liked it or not. But I keep watching it, so I'm like, okay, I guess I like it. Um, but I'm, I mean, they're doing like a spin-off of Alice in Wonderland, which I think is really interesting, and hopefully that will be uh, that will be good as well. Um, I watch. I, I swear, I, I like I watch everything online. So if it's on Hulu and it's sci-fi, oh, you guys don't have Hulu here, do you? Oh. No. <laughs> I usually pretend to be American. <laughs> but I probably watch it if it's, I don't remember. I honestly watch so many shows. I feel like it's my homework. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, you touched on Revolution. Do you need to go on Revolution? Because it would be awesome. That show is so I cool. I would love to be on Revolution. I love that Writing's show. amazing. Um, but obviously with Supernatural, and I know that they say death means nothing on Supernatural. Yeah. Do you think you may come back at any point as anybody alone going to die? I would love that, but I, I don't know, it's been like four years, right? Or three years? I feel like, yeah, anything can happen, but um, I certainly am not holding my breath about it. Um, but it would be, I would love that. Like, I love working on that show, so that would be amazing. And I was going to say, what about with Misha? What was that like? Oh, he's great. He's, um, it's, it's funny, because when I did a con with him, it was like two or three years ago when my husband came with me, and he, you know, he met Misha, and I, before I introduced him, I was like, so, you know, when I work with Misha, he's like, he's like quiet, and he kind of keeps to himself. Michael was like, what? Who are my husband? I was like, who do you not work with the same guy? Because he's so the opposite of that. And for whatever reason, the first couple episodes I did with him, my impression of him was he's like really serious. Like, I mean, he's so not that at all that I don't know. Maybe he went through a quiet period <laughs> of two episodes and then started talking a lot. But no, he's great. Um, he's always fun to work with. All the guys on the show, and it mostly is guys. Whenever I have like a supernatural convention or, 
or when I was on the show, it's like testosterone in me. So it's an interesting, even if, you know, the cons, I'm like always the only girl that does the supernatural cons, because they can't take more than one girl per con, basically, because, you know, people want boys. <laughs> it's true. Um, uh, but, you know, it's always an interesting trying to, you know, like all of a sudden I'll be competing with them and wow, I don't even, my testosterone is very little compared to you, but somehow like, I have to like, you know, stand my ground for boys. Anyone? Yeah, I was just going to ask a, a question about, you know, um, I guess the, the length of time that shows can find their sort of, their whole, the length of time that shows are like to get an audience, do you get a sense from, from inside, I guess the industry of that length of time is getting less and less and less and you don't from the first go. Uh, I think it's yeah. absolutely ridiculous the amount of money that goes into shooting a pilot or, you know, if you're lucky enough to get the pilot picked up, you'll shoot, you'll go ahead and shoot six, seven, eight episodes and then they'll cancel it after two. I think it's the most ridiculous, I mean, it's because everyone's so money crazy right now. So if, you know, the advertisers aren't getting what they want or what they were promised, then they won't want to advertise in that time slot and then the, and then the network panics. And, I mean, I, I, I like cable a lot better. I think cable has a much, they have much more of a chance to survive. They give them a little bit more time. Um, but on network, I would, I would much rather do cable. <laughs> Network, I think, is just getting ridiculous. And, and the, like, I'll read the pilot, you know, from, I go out for a, a bunch of the pilots, and I'll read them, and I'll, like, like, I read the cult pilot. I don't know if you guys have seen that show on the CW. It probably hasn't come out here yet. But it was, it was, like, really good and exciting, and, and then I started watching it, and it just didn't live up to the, the pilot. I, I actually, I watched a few episodes, and I was like, oh, I'm glad I didn't book this show, because I would be out of a job. <laughs> and, and it just got canceled the other day. But um, CW did give them at least, I think they aired eight or nine episodes, or ten even. So you got a little more of a chance, you know, maybe it'll pick up an audience, maybe people will catch on, or maybe the writing will get better, I don't know. I mean, that was just my reaction to the show, but I find that it's so shocking, and it happens all the time, that after two episodes, Hollywood is like, no, you're not good enough. Like, well, you just put, like, millions of dollars into this, like, give it a chance. They used to give, I mean, had they not given Seinfeld two years, we wouldn't have Seinfeld. But they canceled it after the first show. I mean, no one liked the show at first. So, they did things differently then, but anyway. Do names like Eric Kripke or Joss Whedon or whatever, do they still make much of a difference in terms of industry? Like, do, does that mean they will be given a bit more of a chance? I think... Perhaps, like um, last year, Alcatraz was a J.J. Abrams pilot, um, and for whatever reason, it just didn't pick up like fast enough. I don't know. Has anyone seen that one? So, I mean, I liked it, but I was like, you know, like where's where are we going to get on board the train? It just didn't, for whatever reason, it didn't pick up speed. And I think in Stargate Universe, that was part of the problem in season one. I I, I watched the pilot when it came out, and I was like, oh, all right. And I didn't watch it until I booked it, and then I went back, and I watched season one, and it was so long. And there wasn't enough, like, what we loved about Battlestar Galactica was this constant threat of aliens, or of the, come on. Silence. Silence. <laughs> Hasn't been that one. But, um, and that was exciting. There was always that threat. But on season one of Stargate Universe, um, I think it tended to focus more on the people inside of the ship, which could be any show of people in an environment. And I think that maybe that is what, it was like not enough of a threat. Finally, season two of the aliens came, you were like, yes! And finally, like, this is so, and then it started getting really good, and they started getting their feet in the ground and figuring out more, and the writing was always good, but it was that it wasn't, I feel like the audience didn't want to know about the drama of Chloe and they just didn't want to know it as much as they wanted to know about the threat of the aliens outside force. Agreed. Very, very much so. Here's the you, you've obviously got quite a, a, a good 
brain in terms of um, story and, and um, how the, the system works. Have you had any thoughts in, in terms of writing or directing or moving into a different part of the industry? Um, never until like two weeks ago. I'm not even joking. I, it's, it's every year for pilot season, it's like dead in their crickets. Anymore. Unless you book to pilot, it's like there's nothing. There's no commercial auditions. There's no theatrical auditions. It's just very dead. So I was like, all right, well, I want to do something. So I just had this idea and I started um, meeting with a couple of my writer friends um, and I, I've already like written a first act I already, and then I was like, oh, I, I should probably know how to write. So I met, you know, met with my writer friends who gave me a couple books and so I've been reading these screenwriting books and I mean, it's not something that I, I would never call myself a writer and who knows if anything ever comes of this, but um, it's, it's great to be doing, I'm, I'm writing like six hours a day. Um, that feels great. I'm doing something creative that is still part of my world. Um, when it's slow, I, I, sh I should be doing something creative, and not just like waiting. That's the, that's like the curse of an actor in LA is thinking that you can just wait for work, which is not true. <laughs> I think fairly legitimately, if you're writing for six hours a day, you could call yourself a writer. Well, I wouldn't, well, okay, well, we'll argue that later. Do you act for six hours a day? When I'm working. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't do that at home. My husband would get really annoyed, bro. Are we being real here? Or? Questions at all about any of the series that's put in the film? Hi, Julie. Hi. You had a quite a big sort of gap in the film. What was it like to return to that? Yeah, there's somebody trying to do it, but it's not to oh, the scope of the okay. US. You know how it is. Right. Yeah. 
that. Now, as a, as a little girl, did you always want to be an actress, or was, was there another career path that may perhaps have happened for you? quick second I wanted to be a veterinarian and then I found out you had to do like eight years of college or something and I was like I want to be an actor. <laughs> I mean I've always kind of been into that idea. I started doing theater from a very young age um, and, and originally it was um, I sang and so it was like um, I wanted to do musical theater, I wanted to do Broadway um, and then I, I also I kind of am really thankful that I'm relatively realistic person because you know I, I was going to school in Boston and I would go down to New York and do auditions every once in a while. Um, and I'd be like you can hear all the girls for you sing. And I was like oh, I was like I could both the lead in any community theater production of you know whatever musical but I was like I just I can't come I mean even if I trained you know all day, every day, I just, you, you know, you're just gifted with these lungs, or you work really hard to have decent lungs. And that's kind of where I, I was. Um, so, I mean, at some point, now my goal was like, okay, apparently now how you do Broadway is you get well known, and then you book a Broadway show, you don't have to. So I'm like, well, I guess that's kind of my route to Broadway. Someday I'll fulfill that child's dream. So there is a desire to go back to, to the theatre? Yeah, I would love to. It's, it's sort of a, a different atmosphere for yeah. TV. Yeah, um, very much. You, you did a lot of community theatre growing up, is that right? Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, we have got time for one last question, and you're it. Congratulations. Hi. I want to know how you got the job of Mad Men and why you didn't. Okay, how I got the show for the job? Um, what, what made you go for it? Well, at that point, I did not have an agent. And I got the audition because there are these things that you can pay to go to, and they may have some, if anyone's an actor out there, like, there are these casting director workshops where you pay, like, 35 bucks, and you get to audition a whole read in front of the casting director for whatever show. Um, and so I would illegally get the breakdown sent to me, which is the breakdown to what the um, casting director send out to agents so that the agents can submit their clients. So I would get them so that, because I didn't have an agent, so I would see like what I was right for, and then I would go to like see if there was a workshop of that casting director for that job I'm right for. I mean, it was like a strategy, because I didn't have anyone repping me at the time. And I ended up getting this audition um, because I had met with the casting director the night before, and she brought me in for, uh, I can't even remember the name of the character, but it was this character in, just in the pilot. Um, she was kind of a sexy, sexy role. And I went in for it, like, it's not usually my, my game, but, so I did it, and then I went home, and she called me, and she's like, so you're not ready for that. I was like, no. <laughs> Um, but she's like, she said, there's one more role, if you come back, um, you can read for producers, it's only got a line, but it's potentially recurring. And I was like, sure. At that point, if anyone offered me an audition, I took it. I was doing student films every weekend at Columbia Grad, you know, the, the film program up there. Um, that was my life. I would try to be getting auditions for legitimate stuff during the week, and then I'd be doing student films on the weekend. So getting an audition, Yes, I'll take it. As long as it's you know, as long as it's legitimate. So um, I got that, and then when we shot the pilot, we were, you know, waited about a year to see if it was picked up. And when it got picked up, I um, was actually doing a show off Broadway at the time um, with this guy David Yellow, who was British. I don't know if you guys know him. He's a fantastic actor. And I was having a conversation with him, and I was trying to like figure out how I could find out if they were going to use me, you know, and I was a young man, like, I didn't know that I could just be like, hey, do you want to use me? <laughs> so I, like, just called my agent, and I had fun with an agent at that point, um, and they called, and they said, you know, if you want to do it, you can fly yourself out to LA. Um, so I was flying myself back and forth. I think I broke even by the end of season one with with flying back and forth, because I had 
rent my car, rent my own car. Luckily, my husband's family lives in Pasadena, so I would stay with them, but um, made no money. But but then for season two, I just stayed out there because I figured you'd be getting more work out there anyway. So, um, so that's my detailed story. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's when you first start out being an actor, it's like they they're not lying when you're pounding the pavement and you're just trying every angle. I always say like, you know, everyone's lined up at the front door to get in. And I'm like, fuck that. Like, let me like take an axe to like the side of the house so I can find a way in because everyone's trying to go in the front door. I can't do it that way. It's, the line's too long. <laughs> well, I really hope that your writing was your axe to the side of the house. Uh, <laughs> use it again, thank you, it's good. <laughs> Look, Julie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and thank you guys for coming out um, last minute. And, uh, I really um, photos and autographs, so come say hi to me. It's nice to meet you guys. She, she has proven to be extraordinarily lovely, and this is going to be at least one that you can walk away from, not dead. So, yes. <laughs> unless I strangle you backstage. No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that because you're quite nice. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please thank you and put your hands together. Lovely. Here in about five minutes' time, we have the cast and crew of Sushi Girl, which includes...